Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. And we're going to be starting things out with a couple of pieces of AMD news, the first of which concerns the RX 5500 series GPUs and the RX 5600 series GPUs. Despite the fact that it feels like eons have passed since AMD officially announced the RX 5500 series, they still haven't been released yet. Well, the good news is that the GPUs are apparently going to launch next week, which I think most people would agree about time. Amazingly, there's still no confirmed details of what's going on, though, with the full-fledged Nave 14 GPU variant. So it's still unclear whether the RX 5500 XT will be exclusive to OEMs or whether that will eventually trickle down to the regular consumer. So it's kind of weird to be honest, we still don't have that confirmed, but according to videocards.com we will at least be able to buy the GPUs next week. But we also have some information concerning the RX 5600. Unfortunately specifications are, well, kind of sparse at the moment. What we do know though is that they will be utilizing the GDDR6 memory type and 192-bit memory bus. I kind of expect that this is going to be a Nave 10 based GPU, albeit with some cuts made to the number of shaders. Funnily enough, about a month or so ago I did release a video which detailed what I expected for the uh, plans for AMD's upcoming GPUs and I did kind of speculate that there would be an RX 5600. Unfortunately for the upper tier GPUs like the RX 5800 slash 5900 that information now is probably inaccurate because from what we understand Nave 12 isn't big Nave instead it is Nave 10 albeit with uh, HBM2 memory and most likely going to be exclusive for Apple and um for those who want a high-end GPU from AMD, it looks like that's going to be Nave 21 slash Nave 23. That's what I was told by one of my sources AMD are referring to internally as the NVIDIA killer. And of course, we've actually seen the uh, code names of Nave 21 and 23 confirmed now in drivers as well. So what about price and performance of the RX 5600? Well, obviously, we have still not even seen leaked benchmarks and AMD haven't even confirmed the existence of the RX 5600. But if it is using a cut-down Nave die, it's logical that we would see performance right smack bang between the RX 5500 and 5700. I'm going to probably say that they're going to charge maybe the 200 to 230 US dollar mark, given that you can pick up some RX 5700s now for like the 300 buck mark, particularly given that we've had some really good deals over Black Friday. And we kind of expect the RX 5500 to retail at around the 150, 160 US dollar mark up maximum. I still can't believe we don't have an official price for the RX 5500. Anyway, um, yeah, so basically probably around the 200 to 250 US dollar mark for the 5600. And there is quite a, a gulf in performance between the 5500 which is essentially acting as a replacement for the RX 580 and of course the RX 5700. Given that the rumoured bus whip for this GPU is 192 bit, it therefore logically follows that we will see a 6 gigabyte uh, frame buffer for the GPU. It's very unlikely, let's face it, they're going to release a 3 gigabyte variant of this particular card. It would just be nowhere near enough memory for this particular uh, performance tier. So 6 gigabytes would be less technically than the RX 5500 uh, because there are supposedly going to be 4 and 8 gigabyte variants of this GPU. And now moving over to the Ryzen 4000 series and the X670 platform. That's right, despite the fact it's only a few days ago, essentially we saw the release of the uh, Ryzen 9 3950X and Fred Ripper, of course. There are already rumours concerning the release date of the next generation Ryzen CPUs, which of course will be using the Zen 3 microprocessor architecture. So the website mydrivers.com claim that we will see the release of the platform, the X670 platform, and the Ryzen, 3, uh, Ryzen 4000 series, excuse, excuse me, by the end of next year. And honestly, the release date kind of makes sense given the launch date of the Ryzen 3000 series. Don't forget that the Ryzen 3000 series launched in July, the 7th of July, whereas we saw 
Uh, the previous generation uh, Ryzen CPUs like the Ryzen 2000 and 3000 launched in like March slash April period. So if you look in terms of calendar months, it would make logical sense for it to launch in the end of the third quarter of next year slash at some point in Q4 of next year. So that kind of lines up for me. Details are very scarce at the moment of what we can expect from the Ryzen 4000 series platform. It does mark the end of the backward compatibility promise, which AMD made back in 2017. What we are almost certain of is that it will be utilizing DDDR4 DDR4 memory, excuse me, as well as PCIe4. Most likely, it's going to require an entirely different platform. Uh, so that would be the Ryzen 5000 series, presumably, to uh, change the memory type as well as support PCIe5. Although, of course, it's potentially possible that they may introduce uh, PCIe5 support. And we will also see the same number of uh, CPU cores I've heard for not just Threadripper, but for also Ryzen uh, 4000 series. So in other words, we will see up to 16 cores, 32 threads for the Ryzen uh, 4000 series. The big change here is going to simply be the improvement in clock frequency because they are using 7NM+, Plus, which is based on EUV process. And also there will be some IPC gains as well. I'm hearing from my sources around 10%, 12% is most likely what they're going to be doing on average. And I say it in such a way because, of course, what is an average CPU load? Some people will say it's like Cinebench. Other people will say it's single-threaded. Other people will say it's this and that. So it's very difficult to get what you can consider an average uh, performance benchmark. But supposedly, from multiple different applications, I'm being told that it's around 8 to 12% uh, across a variety of different tasks. The distinct difference, however, is heavy floating point. Um, I recently created a video on this, so you can check it out if you want. But I've been told that in certain applications which really leverage floating point performance, uh, it can be up to 50% faster with the Zen 3 CPUs. This is most likely uh, AMD targeting the, um, the high-end desktop market as well as, of course, the server market. I'd also like to bring to your attention on this video yet further information concerning Intel's Rocket Lake, but we also have a bit of information concerning Tiger Lake as well for the desktop market. So Rocket Lake has been extremely mysterious for those who have not watched the last couple of videos. Basically, uh, what we have known, of course, for some time now is that Comet Lake is based on the Skylake architecture on the 14NM process and will be up to 10 cores, 20 threads, and we think that it's got higher clock frequency uh, across the CPU and so on and so on. But basically speaking, it's, based, it's the Skylake architecture that we all know and... Um, uh, love. And the big question though is what exactly is Rocket Lake? So Rocket Lake has been seen in roadmaps for some time and we know that it's based on the 14NM process but there are a lot of questions. There have been a lot of rumors that it is utilizing a Gen 12 iGPU and there have been some questions of whether it's uh, Skylake based or whether it's some future architecture. I personally got told that it's a backport of a future architecture. I was personally told it was Sunny Cove, but I was a bit uh, skeptical about that in one way because Sunny Cove would be kind of old by the time that Rocket Lake launched. After all, Rocket Lake uh, launches in, from what we know anyway, 2021, and uh, Comet Lake launches, it looks like anyway, the first quarter of next year. So that would be uh, Q1 2020. Anyway, a couple of different posts on Twitter claim to have information concerning Rocket Lake as well as Tiger Lake. So myself and several others were discussing things on Twitter. A couple of these guys, such as 0x22h, are pretty well-known industry insiders with very good sources. They've actually got a really good track record with leaks. And we were basically focusing our conversation on what Intel's strategy would be on the mainstream desktop processors. So once again, we're not focusing on, let's say, the HEDT market. We are purely focused on mainstream. As we all know, Comet Lake has 10 cores, 20 threads, but Rocket Lake is said to only have eight CPU cores, but is based on Willow Cove, which is obviously a considerably more advanced architecture. Willow Cove, we could say, has way better IPC compared to uh, Sunny Cove and also, of course, Skylake, 
which would mean for AMD to compete, AMD would probably need maybe 25 to 30 odd percent IPC gain over Zen 2, which is obviously really impressive. Intel will presumably also kick the clock frequency up as high as possible, but even so, let's say that Intel does have the IPC advantage, and let's say Intel does have the clock frequency advantage, they would still be massively behind in terms of core count, because we would see 8 CPU cores versus, we could say at the very least, 16 CPU cores for Ryzen 4000 or maybe Ryzen 5000 by the time these processors launch. So, I speculated that maybe Intel would be competing in terms of price. They would keep the platform costs as cheap as possible, crank the clock frequency as high as humanly possible, and for the HEDT market, maybe we'd see 10 cores plus. It's speculation, and also I speculated that potentially we would see the same platform for the successor of Rocket Lake, which is Tiger Lake. According to 0x22h, the chipset of Rocket Lake is almost the same as Tiger Lake's. Additionally, Rocket Lake can also use Comet Lake's chipset, but functionality will be limited. Tiger Lake will go to 10 processor cores. And then 0x22h responded that yes, they would certainly be coexisting for a while, but market strategy is, quote, changeable, and he can't be certain that this is the case. There's also some rumours that we will see an increase in the width of DMI, so it would go from my times 4 link up to times 8, which would certainly be good for integrated peripherals, as it links directly to the PCH. And the very final piece of news that I want to slip in today, and yes, it doesn't really fit in with the rest of the topics, but it's also one of my favourite game series, so I wanted to mention it, to be totally honest. I couldn't really think of a good excuse, so I'm just going to nudge it in anyway. And that concerns Resident Evil 3. We all know that Resident Evil 2 was extremely successful for Capcom, and honestly, if you've yet to play it because you've been a bit on the fence of whether it's worth trying out, I personally think it's one of the best games of this year. Let me know in the comments if you disagree, but I think it's done extremely well uh, in terms of a homage to the original source material, but also kind of modernizing it and just making it an amazing experience. It does have a couple of areas that I personally felt weren't quite up to par. I thought the whole Mr. X thing at points could kind of not get that scary. It's more just like, oh, really, again? But on average, I think the game was amazing. Plus, as well, the PC port was really, really nice. Anyway, um, this news concerns Resident Evil 3 because it has actually appeared on an online database. So there is actually a website which tracks the PlayStation Network. It basically tracks the API of the PlayStation Network, and it's called Gamstat. That's G-A-M-S-T-A-T. And this website has actually uncovered a couple of different covers for Resident Evil 3. One includes a biohazard. Obviously, this is not official confirmation that Resident Evil 3 exists, so at the end of the day, there could be a mistake. Capcom could decide to pull it, not release it, blah, blah, blah. But I would say that there's a very good chance that in the not-too-distant future, we're going to see official confirmation that Resident Evil 3 exists. And now in the final, final piece of news for today, I would like to wish a happy 25th birthday to the original PlayStation. I don't know how it's 25 years ago that the original PlayStation launched, but there you have it. And I have to admit, I did not pick up a PlayStation at the original launch in Europe. I got one a bit later on. I actually uh, entered the 32-bit era with a Sega Saturn. And I actually love the Sega Saturn even now. I think it's got some amazing games on it. Uh, Panzer Dragoon Saga is one of my favourite RPGs of all time. I absolutely loved the fighting games that were on it, particularly the Capcom ones like Marvel vs. Capcom, Vampire Saviour. So I definitely loved my choice of, of picking up a uh, Sega Saturn. Well, I say my choice. Actually, my parents bought it for me because I was extremely young at the time. But nevertheless, I jumped into the PlayStation a little bit later on. I basically picked it up along with the release of Final Fantasy VII and also grabbed a whole bunch of games within the first several months of owning one, like Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, and 
well, funnily enough, Resident Evil 2, of course, was a big part of my uh, PlayStation experience. So it's really weird that the system is now 25 years old, but happy birthday to the PlayStation. So in the comments, let me know some of your favorite memories of the original PlayStation. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then of course, uh, get subscribed for much more content and also leave a like on the video because it helps us out a ton. You can also follow us on the social media platform of your choice, which you can find linked in the description of this very video. But for now, I'm going to let you all go. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.